Hello, everybody. I'm glad to see you all here to uh, see that there are many people who have registered and there's some people even chatting on our you know, chat box already. So welcome, everyone. I can see people from different places. Um, one person from Bratsk, so welcome. Um, I'm in Nizhny Novgorod. My name is Veronika Bandorina. And just a bit about me. So I've been teaching and teacher training for over 15 years. And in the recent years, my main sphere of expertise has been Cambridge exams, mainly FCE, CE, CPE, and TKT, uh, the names of which have recently been changed to uh, Cambridge First, Cambridge Advanced, and Cambridge Proficiency, uh, respectively. Um, so uh, you might want to ask this question. Uh, why in our hectic modern world, especially in a mega city, one uh, would want even more stress and pressure with exams? Well, the answer is simple. My reason is not the exam itself. Uh, I would say it is the process of preparation that matters. And we're talking here about life skills, about 21st century skills. Uh, my own statistics show that Cambridge Advanced Preparation course teaches you to perceive texts differently, written or oral texts. Um, it teaches you to structure your thoughts in another way, I'd say a more coherent way in contrast with other exams. And also uh, it fights the fear of making mistakes, as in Yuga, for example. Since CAE encourages ambitious usage of structures, uh, even if used not accurately, as long as the message is understood. So it develops you in ways that go far beyond the language, uh, making you grow as a personality and making you a global citizen. Um, for example, my group of CAE teenagers in one year started expressing deeper ideas on a grown-up level in contrast with FC, for example. So today, um, yeah, I can see people joining from Irkutsk to welcome. So today we're going to have an overview of this exam, uh, Cambridge Advanced or CAE, which it used to be called, uh, what it consists of and um, some other introductory things that you need to know to start this preparation. Uh, this webinar today is both for uh, teachers who want to take this exam themselves or prepare their students for a CAE exam. Um, I welcome you to chat with me in the chat box. I can see it so I can read the questions and react. So I hope this session is going to be interactive. And throughout the webinar, uh, I'm going to be asking you some questions and I'll be expecting you to type in your answers. So do communicate with me. Um, so I want, to, I want to know that I am heard and uh, that we have some interaction here. Okay. Yes, um, welcome to our online webinar. Right, so um, if you can hear me, if you can see me, if everything is okay, uh, type in something in our chat box, as in, I can hear you well, I can see you well, everything is fine. Yeah, okay, right. Um, so to start off, I have the first slide for you, which is an introductory slide, and here we go. This is a CA fact file. Um, this is a set of questions that I want you to read and try to answer. So let's start with the first one. What is the official name of the exam? Could you please type in your answers in the chat box? No one is talking to me. Okay, please, your answers in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I'll wait just a bit more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so while I'm waiting for the answers, you can read all the other questions and try to think about how you would answer those questions, all right? So we've got 11 different questions here. I'll show you the answers in a bit, but before that, um, I'd like to see what your thoughts about this are. Okay. Let's see. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. Um, so we can start with the first question while uh, we're trying to, yes, okay. I can see the first answer. Yes, okay, people are communicating with me. Uh, the first question is, what is the official name of the exam? So it used to be called CAE. Now they have changed it to Cambridge Advanced. Here is the answer. Uh, uh, as long as all the other ones, like FCE to Cambridge First. So this is the official one. And this is the thing that you're going to have in your certificate, Cambridge Advanced. This is the official name. And uh, so I can see Nadezhda who already answered the second question. Well done, Nadezhda. So the level of English you need to pass this exam is C1. Exactly right. And it corresponds to which level? Could you also please type in your answer? Answers, no, no answers. Okay. And also the other questions you wanna uh, answer, you can type in your questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the level C1 according to Sephora Cambridge um, official scale. Uh, it corresponds to the advanced level of English, so that you know. And as for the grades, yes, what is this said? <laughs> okay, uh, how is it graded? So there are three options, A, B, C, pass with merit, pass, fail, good, uh, uh, very good, good or satisfactory. So which one? Tell me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are no answers. I'd really like you to talk to me here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it is graded in this way. So the answer is A, B, C. So the best one obviously is A. Yeah, B is also good and C is a pass. So how do these grades correspond to the levels? Obviously, there is some difference. So if you get uh, pass C or pass B or pass A, there is a difference in the certificate you're going to get. Uh, what would that be? Any ideas? Um, I'm waiting for your answers in the chat box. Okay, no one wants to uh, type in the answers. Anyway, so uh, we get uh, pass C or pass B and the certificate that we receive would be uh, advanced level of English, um, CAE, Cambridge Advanced. However, if you exceed this um, level and if you get pass A, your certificate, I'll show you the thing that you're going to get. Uh, the certificate will look like this. Um, so here we see that this is pass at grade B, pass B, yeah, so your level of English would be advanced. However, if you have here pass, uh, pass A, pass at grade A, it means that your level of English will be C2. C2 is proficiency and here you will have it stated, yeah, certificate in proficiency. And uh, this is a nice thing, so you have exceeded that. Um, right. There is another question here. So if you fail one, two, three parts, do you still get a certificate? This is a tricky question and people usually get quite anxious before the exam at the exam because, well, you pay uh, quite a lot of money for it. And um, if you fail something, can you still get a certificate? What is the answer? Could you please type in the answer? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage your participation. I'd really appreciate it if you uh, answered my questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, so the answer, yes, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, could you please answer the question? So 
Uh, if you fail one, two, three parts, do you still get a certificate? The answer is yes. And uh, for that, I want to refer to this uh, next slide. Here we go. Um, and this is a slide with um, the score, as you can say, hopefully. Um, so we can see that every part of the exam has a different number of points that you can get. And now those points correspond to the uh, Cambridge score, to the Cambridge scale. Uh, so this is a unified system which allows uh, Cambridge examiners count your uh, score and count the average. For example, the first part here is reading. And for example, you get um, grade B in reading. Yeah, you're quite good at reading, for example, and you get 193. However, you're not that good at use of English, for example, and you fail it, let's say, at uh, 170, and so on and so forth. The point is that you use this score, uh, you add one, two, three, four, five, divided by five, and you get the average. If your average uh, is a pass score, uh, C1 level, you get a certificate. We can even count it approximately. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it now, but you can play with it later on using the calculator. So you just add the score and see that you can fail even three parts if you uh, excel at two and you get maximum score. So this is like stress-free environment. You can be very good at speaking and writing and then not very good at this and you still pass and you get a certificate, which is nice. However, even if you fail uh, as in B2 level, so your average score corresponds to, for example, 170 according to uh, Cambridge school, uh, scale, this scale. Um, and uh, you still get the certificate. Um, and here, you will have it stated that you have uh, the upper intermediate level of English. So this exam allows you to get a certificate in three different levels, uh, B2, C1, and C2, which is great. And this is a recent development. They didn't used to have it uh, before. This is very nice. Okay, so we're carrying on. And the answer to this one, do you still get a certificate if you fail something is yes, you do. The next question is, can you retake this exam? Well, obviously you can. Uh, usually people ask me, how many times can you do that? Well, as many times as you want. And I usually paraphrase it, you know, as much money as you have because the exam is quite pricey. Uh, however, uh, if you have passed C at the exam, um, I, I'm not sure that you should retake it. Possibly you should aim at the next one. Well, it's your choice. You can decide. How long is this certificate valid for? Uh, well, the expiry date, yeah? So we know that like IELTS and TOEFL, they have their expiry dates, yeah, some years. And here, the beauty is that this is forever. It has no expiry date. Once you take this exam and you get the certificate, this is forever. And you can use it to apply for a job abroad or study somewhere um, 20 years from now. Obviously, we all know that our level of English is not increasing if we're not practicing it regularly. And the uh, real level of English may not be valid, actually. But the certificate will be. The next question is, uh, well, hello, everyone. Everyone is... Uh, Greeting, everyone. Um, the next question is, how many parts does the exam have? This is question number 10. I'd still encourage you to type in your answers in the chat box, if you could, please. How many parts? One, two, three, four, or five? I actually showed you the next slide, which had those answers. So if you've been uh, quite attentive, you can answer this question easily. Okay, people are still greeting each other. <laughs> okay, anyway, 
uh, this exam has, okay, last chance to answer, no? <laughs> okay, right, this exam has five parts. What are the parts? So maybe that question, no? Okay, um, five parts. And here they are. The first part, reading, then use of English, listening, writing and speaking. And the score is counted separately for each part. And then as I have already said, uh, you will get the average and this will be your score for the exam. Um, some people say that there are four parts. Well, there are four papers that you take because reading and use of English would be one paper, but still counted separately. So now we're going to have a look at those parts and what they consist of and typical problems and uh, mistake exam takers make and my tips on how to deal with those. So the first part, the first paper that you're going to sit at the exam would be reading and use of English. And here is the fact file about the first paper. So once again, this is going to be one paper, but two parts counted separately according to Cambridge scale. Uh, so reading consists of five parts. Uh, in the exam, you'll have them um, one, five, six, seven, and eight. Parts one and eight will earn you one point per question. Five, six, seven, two points per question. What does it mean? If you, if you don't want to type in your answers in the chat box, at least think about it before I give you the, the answer. So it basically means that parts one and eight are a bit easier than uh, parts five, six, and seven in the reading part. And the reading part is considered to be the hardest part usually, um, possibly because there is not enough time and the tasks are really challenging and all of them are different. They test different subskills of your uh, reading ability. And this causes some issues. And you also have to get used to the format, which is also important. So my, my tip for you for this part of the exam is do the hard tasks last. We're going to have a look at those uh, parts now in a bit, in a minute. So if you know that this this part is challenging for you and it takes a lot of time, leave it for last. Because if you start doing it at first, you will spend all your time on it and you won't have time for the easier parts and your score will not be as good as expected. Um, otherwise, when you do the easy parts and you'll have all the rest of the time for those parts, this would be stress-free environment, you'll know what to do uh, and how much time you have left for those parts. There is one more thing uh, I wanted to tell you about that. So as in any exam, um, this part, the receptive skills part, the reading use of English part and, and listening part, you'll have to transfer your answers into the answer sheet, uh, which looks uh, pretty much like any other answer sheet like in Yuga, for example. So um, there are two ways, right, usually. Um, People um, at together they tell you, so you have to transfer your answers 10 minutes before the end of the exam. I would advise against that because there are lots of parts and there's stress involved. So I advise you to transfer your answers after each part. You do part one, then two, transfer. So this, uh, this would possibly um, also help you avoid some mistakes while transferring, you know, and come back to that later on to check. As for reading, my general piece of advice for you people would be to read texts of various types and registers. Registers uh, are styles. Because you can have lots of different types of texts, um, articles and um, abstracts from fiction books, and you have to be ready to perceive and understand and work with those different types of texts. So expose yourselves to those uh, different um, types and uh, resources. In use of English though, you have just three parts. Uh, those are parts two, three, four. And in parts two and three, you get one point per question. And in part four, two points per question. And as we said earlier, as we discussed earlier, uh, it means that part four is definitely the hardest one, right? 
Um, what should we do in this part? Okay, I'll give you life hacks and then we will look at the tasks. So um, if you don't know and if you're not sure, never leave the any gaps um, unfilled. So write something, write anything. And for that, especially for part one, I advise you to use the strategy of an educated guess. Um, teenagers call it randomizer. Yeah, an educated guess is something that um, you can do using your uh, passive knowledge of the language. And if you can choose not from four, but from two, this uh, enhances your chances of success. And definitely, uh, once you read or listen to texts of uh, different types, afterwards, exploit those texts for the language because just one book, one course book is never enough to prepare for this exam. The exam is quite challenging. I guess you know it. Yeah, you will see in a bit. So you have to take as much language from the sources, uh, from many resources as you can. And the best sources would be authentic texts of any type. So just use the phrases that you find in the text. Um, write them in your um, dictionaries, vocabularies. Uh, activate them in speaking and in writing. And this can help you succeed at the exam. So let's look at the at those parts, reading and use of English, just one by one, uh, and what they are and how to uh, deal with them. So this is the first part of the paper, reading and use of English. And the first part, do you remember? Was it reading or use of English? Who remembers? People stopped chatting in the chat box. Hopefully they're listening. I want you to speak to me too, to interact with me. I would really appreciate it. Okay, so um, the first part is reading. However, many people have a question why, because basically here you have options, you have to put into the gaps, and this is the language that is checked. So why reading? Because for that, uh, you need to read and understand the whole text, and the answer very frequently lies not in the sentence and the surrounding phrases, but possibly in the paragraph, sometimes in the paragraph after or before that. Uh, and here, in this task, um, you are expected to um, know that those are the life hacks. So to know a lot of collocations, yeah? Collocations are words that frequently go together. Uh, and you definitely have to look at the context and the frequency, because sometimes we can use uh, many words to fit into the gap, but um, the frequency matters. So what are the most frequently used words or phrases in this context? Which word is connected to the other word and used more frequently? And for this task, I was talking about this um, tip of an educated guess. So let's have a look. Um, you have, you can see here this example. Zero, yeah? And the first sentence, so this text is about studying black bears, right? So this is like an article possibly from some kind of a science, um, scientific magazine, possibly. Yeah, online maybe. So this person is writing about black bears. And uh, the first sentence goes, after, after years studying North America, North America's black bears in the and then zero way, and the options are straight, common, everyday, conventional way. So this example uh, already gives you the answer. The answer is D, conventional way. So why not common way? Why not everyday way? Why not straight way? If you don't know, for example, possibly you have this gut feeling of the language, you can follow it. it well, it usually gives you the correct answer. Yeah, your gut feeling never lies. Um, possibly you can feel that the one that does not fit, fit here would be straight and maybe every day. So you're down to two options. And if you have a choice of two, yeah, this is this 50, 50% 50 chance of winning, yeah, of guessing right. And this is what I call educated guess. So eliminate the options that do not fit first if you don't know the answer. This helps a lot. Let's try it with number one. Um, he, yeah, Luke Robertson, who felt no closer to understanding the creatures, he realized 
that he had to then gap their trust. And the options are here. So Luke had to catch their trust, win their trust, or achieve their trust, or receive their trust. So um, if you could type in the correct answer in the chat box, I'd appreciate it. And while you're at it, I'll um, speculate for a bit. So here, uh, our collocation that is checked upon is um, a verb and a noun. The noun is trust. So what is the verb that collocates with trust? Maybe if you don't know, yeah, if you don't know the answer, you can eliminate the options that do not fit. So, um, yes, hello, people. Uh, so um, which ones are the ones that definitely are not the answers? Maybe uh, you could say that this is catch their trust, right? Or achieve trust. Yeah, we achieve goals, but uh, not trust. We can't. Yes. So we're down to win or receive. Which one would that be? Using our uh, educated guess uh, strategy. I'll give you uh, possibly 10 seconds for that. Okay, and the answer is, drum roll, tell me, tell me. Okay, even if you haven't, um, if you have not typed in any, any options, any answers there in the chat box, um, even if you haven't, at least think about it, right? So check yourselves. The answer is win their trust, this is B. And this is how it works, okay? The educated guest strategy and how you do this task. And if you carry on doing this, you can see that uh, lots of it is based on collocations, more rarely about grammar, that's about grammar, or sometimes about cohesive uh, devices, right? Like despite the fact that, or something like that. So this is task number one. And once again, this is reading. And here you get one point per each answer. If you don't know the answer here, educated guess. Don't leave the gap uh, unfilled. Part two of your uh, first paper that you're going to sit at the exam is about reading use of English. Okay, right. This is use of English. Uh, if you look at this text, you can see again that there are gaps, but the difference, um, uh, were, but the difference is in this task, in contrast with the first task, that you don't have the options, right? So you have to take those answers out of thin air, your passive vocabulary, something like that. And the first one, the zero one, is always given for you as an example. The truth is possibly somewhere at the back of your mind and you know the answer. So again, trusting your gut feeling helps here. Okay, let's look at this option, yeah, this answer. So the truth is nobody really knows how language first began, right? So um, what is this? Yeah, this is an auxiliary. This is a verb here. Yeah, and uh, this is this verb is part of this phrase. The truth is, and it it also is a collocation. So here, we also speak about vocabulary a lot, and also grammar. Yeah, grammatical structures are somehow checked upon in this task too. In each gap, you can write only one word. Okay. Um, when word fits, and sometimes there are options. Yeah, in the answers you have options. Mm. Mostly here you have functional words, meaning that you won't be asked to write like um, different, uh, for example, adjectives, synonyms, uh, beautiful, amazing. Yeah, mostly functional words, and the answer is kind of clear from the context. It relies on frequency again and collocations. Uh, so we can look at this next gap here. Uh, so the first, this, this text is about the origin of language. So the truth is nobody really knows how language first began. Um, did we all start talking at around the same time Then one word is missing? Of the manner in which our brains had begun to develop. 
So what is missing in this gap? This is, you know, somehow more challenging than the first one because the first one was like a boom, yeah, it was kind of a, something that shoots. Um, and if you also could type in your answers, I'd appreciate it. Or at least think about it. Yeah, think about the answer while you're doing that. Um, I'll keep talking and giving you tips. So here, uh, with this gap, which is kind of challenging, and usually uh, it causes some issues and people panic and they say, I don't know what is here. So read carefully. Yeah, read the sentence before that. Sometimes it gives you the answer. Because if you look at that, the truth is nobody really knows. Yeah, so there is some kind of opposition in this. Yeah, did we all start talking at around the same time? So which word connects the first part of the sentence and the second one of the manner in which our brains had begun to develop? So which one is missing? What do you think? Which word uh, collocates with off? And this is a, a linker here. Okay. So the answer is, the answer is because. Yeah. Did we all start talking at around the same time because of the manner in which our brains had begun to develop? How to check? Well, the sentence should make sense. Uh, the sentence before that and this sentence and the rest of the text. So once you do this task, um, don't be lazy and read the whole text again for all of it to make sense. If you don't know, again, uh, don't, don't leave the gap blank. Write something, anything. You might guess the correct answer. So part two will give you, will earn you one point per question again, and this is use of English already. Okay, part three, reading the use of English, do you remember? Part three, use of English. And this might look really familiar to most of you preparing for uh, Olga and Yiga. This is a word building, word formation activity uh, task in which you have a text and words, you know, in this right column. And you have to create um, new words using affixation, prefixes, suffixes, and making the right choice here. Um, so the words you have to change are on the same line here, as in here you have professional, and the first, uh, the zero option is given it's professional, so we create an adjective from a noun, nothing fancy. Um, so the things that uh, sometimes you might wanna uh, leave the word as it is, you cannot do that here, you have to change the word somehow in any way that you can, even if you feel that this is kind of okay for this gap, you have to change it. The questions you should ask uh, yourselves, well, definitely you should read the context. And again, here uh, in this exam, context is not the phrase before and after. Mm, sometimes go, it goes beyond the sentence of, and the sentence before, the sentence after. And you have to ask yourselves the following questions, like, what is the part of speech that I need here? Uh, is the meaning positive or negative? Yeah possibly this uh, could help, and then transform the word somehow. For example, so here we have uh, the text about sport champions, training sports champions. So what are the abilities that a professional sports person needs? Yeah, very hard question. To guarantee that opponents can be, mm -hmm, speed, stamina, and agility are essential, not to mention outstanding natural talent. And you have the, the, uh, the word come here, yeah? Um, you have the root here from which you have to create uh, the required word. So the first question you ask would be, which part of speech do we need here? Think, which part of speech? Mm -hmm. So we have here can be, yeah? And we need the third form of a verb here. Yeah, The third form of this verb, come, came, come, so we can't leave it like that. We need to add something. What is the meaning that we need here, positive or negative? Can be to guarantee that opponents can be 
Like, what's the meaning? Yeah, that we can win this. Yeah, we can win the championship. So we need a prefix here. Which prefix to create this word that we need? It's a, it's a more challenging one, obviously, than professional. Yeah, this was a piece of cake, the first one, the zero one. Well, number 17 is a bit more tricky. So to guarantee that opponents can be, uh-huh, yes, I can see some answers. People are talking to me finally. That's great. Okay. So can be overcome. Yes. Those of you uh, who got this answer right, congratulations. So that opponents can be overcome. So we can overcome the opponents. Yeah, the third form overcome, overcame, overcome. Speed, stamina, and agility are essential, not to mention outstanding natural talent. So this task is not as easy as it seems at first, and you have to do a lot of tasks like that to see how it works and work out your own strategies for it. But in comparison with all the other tasks in use of English and reading, this one usually does not cause many problems, so to say. However, you can have some options, um, well, in one of the tasks, uh, they had to create an adjective from the word sun, and uh, yes, overcome, someone got it, congratulations, yeah, okay, so in one of those, uh, you had to create uh, an adjective from the root sun, and the text was about some... Uh, I don't remember, some planets, something like that. So the adjective was solar. Basically, what was left from sun was the first letter. So sometimes uh, the uh, answers are more challenging, while in other cases you get profession professional. Yeah. Okay, so don't leave the word unchanged. Look at the context and ask yourselves uh, two questions. Uh, parts of speech, positive or negative? That is part three, use of English. Now, we are here at possibly the most challenging part in the sequence. This is part four. And once again, reading or use of English, who remembers? Right? Okay. So this was use of English. And this part, uh, this task, usually causes uh, lots of problems to the exam takers. Because here you have to transform, and here you have to write a lot, and sometimes there are options. The problem is that the structures that are checked upon in this ask are very regularly not the frequently used ones. So you have to expose yourselves to a variety of different texts to know less frequently used structures. And not always can you find those structures in the books, in the language books, use of English books, uh, with tasks that you have, the practice tasks or tests that you do. That is why, again, exploit the text for the language, because part four is going to happen to you. Let's look at this part. So you have here, yeah, uh, I'm looking at the first example, yeah, zero example, which was given in every part. You have the first sentence here. James would only speak to the head of department alone. Yeah, quite understandable. Who knows why, but so. Um, and then you have a word, one word in bold, which is written under this sentence. You have to transform the first sentence using this word. And you cannot change the word given. So here you have James, then a gap in which at some point you have to use on to the head of department alone. You, in this task, you should paraphrase the first sentence um, as closely as possible, yeah, trying to preserve the initial meaning of the first sentence using from three to six words, yeah, it's written here, three to six words. So no fewer than three, no more than six. And um, a typical mistake is that uh, students, exam takers, they um, write the negative form. Uh, I don't think I wrote it here, but anyway, they write the negative form like don't. And they count it as one word. So negatives, if, even if you're using a contraction, yeah, it's here, they're two words. Either way, you can write do not or don't two words. 
it's important here because the word limit is three to six words. You have to count every time you have to count. And here we have James, something to the head of department alone. Yeah, would only speak is the phrase we need to paraphrase using on. Yeah, here would has this um, meaning of persistence. So they used this verb, insisted on speaking. So we have three words and we used the uh, word given. We didn't change it. Success. OK. Um, let's look at this example. My brother now earns far less than he did when he was younger. Yeah. So this is the initial sentence. Um, you have the word that you should use. This is nearly. Yeah. And then we should paraphrase this part. Now earns something. Yeah. But here you have the word much. Yeah? So you, have, you should use something like the opposite meaning. Yeah. Now as he did when he was younger. So try it. Try to think of an answer. I'll give you like 10 seconds. Okay, even if you are not tapping in your answers, try to think about them, yeah? So three to six words, don't change the word given, preserve the meaning, yeah? Okay, any ideas? No? Okay, I'll show you the answer now. Um, the answer is here, yeah? And as you can see, yeah, it's over here does not or doesn't earn nearly so or as and the second option does not or doesn't make not earn nearly so or as yeah let's let's see so here uh does not earn nearly as much now as he did when he was younger or does not Towards does not doesn't yeah uh, make nearly so much as he did when he was younger. So looking at the answers, you can see two things. The first thing I was talking about does not doesn't uh, two words either way, and you can write it uh, in two ways: contraction or the full form, and it is still counted as the correct one. And then there are options, you know, earn or make so as. So this task allows for some variations in the answers. So uh, as long as it is correct grammatically and lexically. So this is how it works. Part four. And this is the official end of uh, the use of English part of this paper, three tasks, two, three, and four. And the rest of the tasks here will be reading which are usually more challenging. Um, if you ask me, so students or exam takers, uh, they usually come back from the exam and they say it took them 10, 15 minutes to do the use of English part because here it's either you know or you don't uh, spending time or wasting time, precious time at the exam, which is never enough for this paper on trying to remember this or that uh, does not do you any good. So you know you write it, you don't, you skip it, uh, or write at least something, don't leave the gap blank. Spend this precious time on reading, because reading is a killer in this exam. The first part of reading you've seen already. This part five is kind of an okay part, uh, because it is logical and it is something we're well used to. So if you look at it, um, you can see there is a text it's like usually um, one piece of text, an article, or um, some piece, or someone is writing something else. Okay, yeah, uh, an article or part of uh, the chapter from a fiction book, anything. And you have a set of questions, multiple choice. Very simply, uh, nothing much to speak about. You read the first question, you read the options, and you start reading the text. 
because the questions go in the same order. Yeah, this is the beautiful part of this one. Once you find the answer, yeah, underline it, uh, circle the correct one, carry on. Read the second question, find uh, the second answer, maybe in the second paragraph, then like that. That's it. And nothing very difficult about it. While for part sakes, you need to be prepared. Yeah, mentally and physically, you need to do a lot of uh, tasks like that to succeed in it. And this part, this type of task is present only uh, in the line of Cambridge exams, only in CE in Cambridge Advanced. What should you do here? So usually these are uh, article types, pieces of text of different, for example, scientists who are writing on the same topic. The topic here is so more or less the architecture of happiness. A lovely topic, isn't it? So we have four people who have an opinion about that. This is a book by Ellen de Botton, and those people gave their reviews on the book, okay, their opinion. However, they wrote it in a kind of a roundabout, very, you know, like formal scientific way, and sometimes it's very difficult to understand what they meant. So not only do you have to understand what they meant, you have to compare if they agreed or disagreed with each other. And this makes this task really challenging. And that is why I advise you to do this task last, okay? Because, uh, you know, usually it takes people from 20 to 30 minutes to do it properly. And this is like a third of the exam. You have just four little questions here, but they're really painful. Yes, each question will earn you two points, but still it's better to waste eight points than all the rest of the exam, like 25, right? So let's look at the first question. Yeah, I'll just show you what is expected of you. So which reviewer? Yeah, we have four reviews on the topic, on the book. Which reviewer? Uh, question 37 has a different opinion from the others on the confidence with which the bottom discusses architecture. Let's leave the first part of the question uh, alone for a bit, okay? Uh, different opinion doesn't matter. So confidence with which the bottom discusses architecture. So we should look through the text and find the information in each text about how confident the reviewer felt this um, author was about what he was writing. In the first text, yeah, the first reviewer has this phrase, typical self-assurance, yeah? Self-assurance, confidence, synonyms. So basically the person was, uh, so he thinks that Debotton was quite confident, right? The second reviewer, uh, help and support of earlier authors on the subject too. Yeah, help and support. So he needed the help of support of early authors on this subject. Yeah, I'm reading from here. So is this a reviewer? What is the opinion of this reviewer? Does he think that um, the button was confident about architecture or not? Yeah, you're right. So he was not very confident at this point. Reviewer C, bold and amusing judgments. Yeah. Also synonyms to confidence, bold, amusing, judgments, quite confident. And the last reviewer, certainly writes with conviction, conviction, another synonym. So as you can see, you don't see the word confidence per se, as it is in, in any of those texts, but you see some synonyms, yeah, some roundabout way to express the idea of confidence. And if you underline those phrases in each of those texts, it is quite visual now and obvious uh, what the answer to the first question is. So, uh, reviewer A says confident. Yeah, reviewer C says confident. D, confident. While B says that he needed help and support of other authors, right? So, not very confident. That is why which reviewer has a different opinion from others? Yeah, different opinion. The answer would be B. Okay, um, you can refer to this presentation later on to read the text and uh, do the tasks and uh, check um, that you got this idea. However, you know, it's 
I'm just trying to show you this as an example, and it already has taken us around five minutes to do just that. Imagine how much time it will take you to go back to each text and find information and compare it for every single question. So this is a really time-consuming task, and please do it last, okay? However, uh, while preparing for the exam, and as I said, this is what matters, not the results, yeah, not the not the certificate, but the preparation that uh, makes you a global citizen, explore uh, this text and exploit it for the language because um, very frequently in this task you have beautiful examples, scrumptious examples of wonderful structures. And uh, for example, in text B, this is an amazing one, um, architecture is perplexing in how inconsistent is its capacity to generate happiness. Yeah, beautiful one. And in text C, uh, can convey meaning and alter consciousness. So convey meaning, uh, express meaning, there are synonyms, yeah, but convey meaning is a more beautiful collocation, which you can, by the way, meet in part one of your exam. So take out those phrases from these texts, yeah, alter consciousness instead of change consciousness. So once again, this can help you develop um, your language level and upgrade it. These texts, exploit them for the language. Write them out in, in, in your notebook and use them later on in writing and speaking. Activate them. Check them, obviously, before you activate them to know how to use them. And I advise against using uh, separate words. Yeah, use collocations. This exam is about collocations. It's not about just the word alter. Yeah, because if you um, check the word alter in the dictionary, you'll have an entry which is like several pages long. Yeah, and you need a phrase, how to use it, a ready-made phrase. Yeah, alter consciousness, for example, or convey meaning. Yeah, you know, also convey ideas. So, well, good luck with part six with... Um, proper um, preparation and practice, I'm pretty sure you can succeed at that. It just needs some, well, basically some getting used to, yeah. The next part is also a hit with everyone. Um, to tell you the truth, this is my least favorite part of the exam. Um, be it CAE or CPE, you have the same task there. The task looks like this. You've got a text and you've got gaps here. Um, what Cambridge examiners, for some particular reason, did, they just took those paragraphs out of the text and then jumbled them so that you could later on put them back into the text in the correct order. The problem is that you have six gaps and how many options? Right, seven, which means that one paragraph is extra. And this distractor is usually created in a really smart way to bewilder you and confuse you and all of those wonderful things. Uh, what helps here? Well, why I dislike this task? Because for me, it is it seems artificial. Uh, where in life, why would you have to reconstruct this text? What helps? Uh, for me, you can take any text, basically, doesn't matter which type. Yeah, here we have a text about Scottish wildcat, right? Kind of an article again. Um, you just take a text, an article or something like that, and you just cut it into 1,000 little pieces, and then you put it back together. And you basically, you don't even need um, exam test type tasks to practice this. Yeah, just put them together practice and see how it works for you. This task, it checks your ability to spot cohesion and coherence in the text, yeah? How the paragraphs are connected, uh, linkers, cohesive devices, synonyms, everything, yeah? What makes uh, those paragraphs uh, fit together as a text? What unites them? Let's look at the first one. You know, here, zero example is not given, unfortunately. Okay, it starts off nicely. On my living room wall, I have a painting of a wildcat. Why? Who knows? Yeah, uh, by John Holmes, of which I'm extremely fond. It depicts a snarling, spitting animal, teeth bared and back arched, um, a tall, cold uh, spring, ready to unleash some unknown fury. A nice introduction, yes. Yeah? Sets the mood. 
Then the paragraph is missing. And if you read the next paragraph, it starts with however. So in the previous paragraph, which is missing, which you have to put in back, there, um, there is some opposition, yeah, the opposite idea to it. So if you look through the options, yeah, you can you may not even read until the end. Yeah, you can start reading the first line. You have the recruitment of men to the armed forces during yeah, obviously the topic is not this topic, yeah. So you don't have to uh, carry on reading. Try the next one. The wild cape waits for a while and wrapped concentration. Yeah, you can read this one, maybe it is. But here, um, possibly it's not the description of this uh what was it painting yeah so read the look through the next ones and give me your guess okay i'll give you 10 seconds to type in the answer if it's c d e f or j Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the answer here uh, is G. And you can see here, it is a typical image. Yes. Yeah? So we have this connection to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, to um, painting image. And you can see it is a typical image most folk have of the beast. But it is very much a false one, yeah? For the wild cat is little more than a bigger version of the domestic cat. And here you have kind of opposition to the first paragraph, which said, like, bad teeth, you know, an aggressive creature. And then, in the next paragraph, opposition again. However, the physical differences are tangible, yeah? Wild cat is, much, is a much larger animal. This is opposition to this paragraph, which says that uh, wild cat uh, is a little more than a bigger version of a domestic cat. So this is how it works. You put those paragraphs back into the text where they belong. And once you've done that, in this uh, part of the exam, it is obligatory that you read the whole text for it to make sense. If you skip this part, if you skip the stage, uh, you might miss out on some things. Everything should be connected. The paragraph before, the paragraph after, everything should blend into one unity, a beautiful piece of text which you can explore for the language later on, um, exploit it for collocations and grammar constructions. This was part seven uh, of your reading part. And this is part eight. I'm not going to speak a lot about that because we've got three more parts to speak about and not very much time left. So here we've got several texts and a set of questions. Um, and it will earn you one point for each. Uh, the only thing I want to tell you about this one, usually uh, all, exam all examiners or all teachers tell you to read the questions first. In this task, it is kind of useless because you've got a lot of questions. And by the fifth one, you possibly will forget um, about the first one. So what I advise you to do is read the first text. Yeah, it is more or less clear what it is about. And then look through the options because this is scanning. You have to scan the text to find the uh, corresponding options. They are synonyms. Obviously, you won't find the same words there. So the text first and then um, find the options. Then the second text, which options are about this text, etc. And when you have some questions left unanswered, this may be the case, you can briefly come back. You will already remember approximately what each text was about. So this is how I advise you to do, to deal with this task, okay? This is it. Finally, we're done with reading and use of English. Uh, this is a challenging part, and to um, succeed in it, you need to practice a lot, obviously. Writing is the next part. Uh, a brief fact file about writing. So you have to write two things there. There will be two tasks in the exam. Uh, you will be given one hour and 30 minutes, 90 minutes for both parts. 
Um, the first part will be obligatory. It will always be an essay, no choice. While the second part, you'll have a choice of three. And there you will be checked upon different registers, former, formal, semi-formal, informal registers, and you will have to write one of the following. Report, proposal, review, letter. Uh, the point is that for writing, to, um, to be good at it, you have to know the format very well. You have to know the layout, the phrases, yeah? And for that, I advise you to have a look through this book, yeah? It's Gold Advanced. At the back of this book, there's a writing folder, which is really good in terms of the layout, the useful phrases. There are numerous there, so have a look through. And a very good examples, samples of reports so, or proposals. Uh, I advise against writing drafts because for two pieces of writing, which are 220 to 160 words, there won't be enough time definitely. Yeah, so no drafts. I know this is stressful, but you can, you know, make corrections, yeah, cross out words as long as it's understandable. This is fine. Uh, yes, so the first task, uh, the writing criteria uh, assessment. So there will be four things that the Cambridge examiners will look at. The first thing, content, yeah. So are you... Um, on topic or off topic, yeah. So if the task requires you to write about, um, for example, uh, how education can help you find a proper job and you start writing about education, yeah, this is off topic. You have to write about those two things in conjunction. This is content. Communicative achievement. Basically, here we speak about style, yeah and uh, how well you send the message, how well your text is understood. Organization is about linkage, how well connected your text is. And for that, part seven of your reading um, task, of your reading part, can help you a lot. You can take out some cohesive devices from this text. Yeah. And also the layout yeah, for reports and proposals. For example, you have to use headings. Language, obviously, is the fourth criterion. Um, you have to be ambitious, and as you can see here, you should use less common lexes effectively and precisely. Isn't it wonderful, right? And with some degree of control about grammar. So you have to be ambitious here. So um, instead of writing express some ideas, yeah, you write convey meaning, things like that. And for each of those criteria, you get maximum five points, which makes it 20 for each piece of writing and 40 all together for the writing. So 40 uh, points will give you the maximum points. Is it difficult? Yes. Uh, people get maximum points in this writing part very rarely because you have to be perfect at all those four things. Yeah. So uh, as an example of the first part, which is uh, an essay, you can look at the task and see that you have a question, which facilities should receive money from local authorities, and you have three options, and you have some opinions. So you should write your essay discussing two of those options, and you may use these opinions to help you or not, up to you, right? Um, so here, you should also justify your ideas, so you should give reasons, obviously, and examples, yeah should be all, all linked. Basically, typical mistakes are people try to write about three things. Don't do that. Choose two and answer the question. And in the conclusion, you are usually asked to choose one thing. Like here, you can see, you should explain which facility is more important. For example, you choose uh, museums and sports centers and you write about why museums should receive money or well, paraphrase uh, get funds from local government and why sports centers should get them and then in the conclusion which one should be sponsored and why yeah for the essay instead of the uh, draft I advise you to write this essay map which can help you save time uh, and not to forget to write about everything. So there should be an introduction in which you state the problem and list two points you're going to write about. Paragraph one, for example, about museums, where you write 
about the first idea and supported by the argument and an example. And the second one, for example, sports, uh, sporting, what was it? Uh, sports centers, uh, supporting arguments, etc. And in the conclusion, you should choose one idea and say why you uh, are in favor of this idea. This essay, in this essay map, you write like brief notes. Yeah, you are brainstorming your ideas. And then, while writing the essay, you should elaborate on that. Yeah, you should expand on the ideas. You should write them in four sentences. This is my uh, tip for writing essays. The second part, as I said, will consist of three uh, options for you to choose from. Here you can choose from a report, review, or letter. To practice, you, uh, you should practice writing all of the types to see which one you're good at. So at the exam, you can write the one that uh, will get you the highest points. Maybe it will be a review, yeah, informal register, or maybe you're very good at formal register report. And once again, uh, the book uh, Gold Advanced, at the back of it, a very good writing folder which can help you master all of the types. Listening. Uh, not very much to speak about here. There will be four parts. It is challenging, yeah, but uh, to prepare for it, you need to practice once again a lot. There will be four parts. Uh, there will be monologues and dialogues. Uh, you will be checked upon uh, skimming, scanning, listening for details and also inferring attitude of the speakers, yeah, the positive or negative about things. And basically here, uh, you will never meet the, the same words and phrases as in the task. It will be paraphrasing, synonyms, maybe sometimes reverse order. And the first task looks like this. It's uh, basically, there will be three dialects and each dialect will have two questions to answer. Yeah, you'll listen to each dialect two times and choose from the options given. Uh, the second task is a bit more challenging because here you've got a gapped text. In each gap, you can write from one to three words. But the problem is that this is not the text you're going to hear. Yeah, this is not a dictation for you. This is a text summary. So you will hear, this is like a kind of a short version of the text you're going to hear. So you need to hear which part this corresponds to, this gap. And you need to fill in the gap with the missing words while the rest of the sentence may be a paraphrase of what you hear, maybe like the opposite one. So look for the cues, underline key words, underline distractors. Typical distractors look like mm, Josh, I'm looking at gap 12, yeah? Josh was particularly impressed, yeah? Particularly is a key word. So he might have been impressed by several types, but particularly impressed by this type of flower, yeah? And you might hear something like he was uh, most, um, he, he loved the most, yeah? Something like that. So read the text before you listen to it, underline keywords, distractors like particularly, and uh, you will hear this text again twice as everything in this uh, listening part. The third part, for me, this is the most challenging one, but not because it's challenging in terms of the language. It's just very long, okay? That might be, uh, they have usually, uh, they usually have their dialect there. It's uh, an interview one, an interviewee. And it's just very long, so by the end of it, you just get tired of the same voices, but you have to pull yourself together and listen to it, because listening goes after reading use of English, one hour and a half, writing one hour and a half. So by listening, you're already exhausted. So be ready for this challenge, okay? Underline key words, listen carefully, multiple choice, nothing fancy. But part four is something that everyone complains about. Part four is a killer. Yeah, in this listening part, you have to listen to everything at the same time, brain explosion zone. What happens here? There will be five speakers and short texts, um, them talking about the same topic, like the topic here, what was it? Uh, changing jobs, yeah, people are talking about changing their jobs. For some reason, people are changing their jobs. Uh, in the first 
task, you will have a list of reasons why each speaker changed the job. And then the second one, what each speaker feels about their new job, right? So each speaker will be given a reason and then speaking about the feelings towards their new uh, place of work. You have five speakers. And the problem is that how many options do you have? Okay, that's eight. <laughs> yeah, so three options are extra. This is the problem. In each task, you have three extra options, which makes it really challenging because you have to focus on everything at the same time. You have to look at both tasks at the same time because they will go like speaker one, yeah? Speaker one, choose from here, and speaker one, choose from here. And this may be not this exact order, like, they may be talking about their feelings towards their new job post and then about the reason why they changed the previous one. So you have to be ready and it goes really, really fast. Speaker one, two, three, four, five. Then again, speaker one, two, three, four, five. You have to focus and the second time you listen, make sure you check, don't panic. If uh, you have missed, for example, speaker two, don't focus on that, listen to the next speaker, okay? Next time you hear, you will fill this in. Don't leave the gaps blank. Uh, listen to it a lot. At first, when you get when you're getting familiar with the task, I advise you to listen to this um, task as many times as you need. Like at home in your comfy uh, environment, you can sit down and listen to those five speakers on repeat twenty times until you hear. Okay, and this helps. Yeah. First you listen 20 times, next time 10 times, you know, and by the end of your preparation, you will need just two times to hear that all. It needs practice, okay? Because at first it is really stressful, listening to everything at the same time and choosing from the options in which three are extra. So six altogether are extra in each task. That's a lot, yes. Okay, this was listening. Um, and the part, yeah, as I said, simultaneously, three extra options. There will be synonyms and you're checked upon a variety of different subskills. The part which is left for us is speaking. Uh, how to succeed in the speaking part? Well, first off, don't panic, okay? People usually panic. You have to get ready for the format. You have to practice a lot. If you're not preparing with a teacher, find yourself a speaking pal with whom you're going to practice. People usually ask me, like, when am I going to be good at that? You know, speaking is closely connected with your general language development. So once you um, uh, get a lot of collocations, yeah, you expand your vocab, you start activating this in speaking and writing, this is when it gets better. After uh, a lot of language work, this is the secret. There will be four parts uh, in speaking. And um, in the exam room, just to prepare you for that, you will have four people. Okay, two of those will be uh, you and your partner. Yeah, candidate B, candidate A, candidate B. You're, you'll be doing this in pairs. And there will be two examiners. The first one will be the interlocutor talking to you. And the second one will be sitting at the back and making notes, basically assessing your speaking. So make sure that, that you're not scared and you're mentally prepared for this number of people in the room. Um, there will be different times. You'll, you'll be expected uh, to give a monologue and dialogue with your partner. So let's look at the parts. Yeah, this is the assessment grade again. You will have five criteria here in contrast with writing. Grammar and lexis here are assessed separately, so you have to be very good at grammar and lexis, and they're given different points. So discourse management, which is about uh, connecting your ideas and using linkers, and being fluent. Pronunciation is assessed here, a separate criteria, which means that it's not about you pr mispronouncing the th sound, right, or a sound. It's more about um, intelligible, yeah? You should be understood, yeah? And you should use, as it says here, uh, phonological features effectively to convey and enhance meaning. And here we talk about not only separate sounds, we speak about 
a word stress, sentence stress, contrastive stress, as in, I do love you, for example, yeah, this is how it works. And interactive communication, your ability to communicate in the format of a dialogue, yeah, that will be a separate task, which is a dialogue. So, uh, and again, five points which are multiplied by five in each criterion can get you uh, maximum points here. And this separate scale is for the interlocutor who cannot be writing everything down, but who will be given uh, their general opinion uh, on your language level. Yeah, just generally handles communication on a wide range of topics. Yeah. Mind that, an interesting fact that here, you do not see the criterion which is content. It's beautiful, isn't it? No one cares about what exactly you say, yeah, as long as you say it in all of those five beautiful ways. So don't be afraid to express your opinion. No one will punish you for it, okay? You're free to have your own opinion on something and express it. Well, um, in an informal, but uh, I mean, no cursing kind of way. So that's it. Um, the first task. Yeah, it will look like this. Uh, the exam, the interlocutor will greet you and will ask you some general um, kind of superficial questions like, where are you from? Yeah, this is a warmer. This is a very fast part. It, it will take two minutes, one minute for each uh, exam taker. And um, there is an option of a group of three, then three minutes, one minute for each. Approximately 20, 30 seconds. But as I've heard, uh, sometimes they stop you after like 10 seconds. So this is a warm-up. However, it is also a chance for you to show off your language level to impress your examiner. That is why the question, where are you from? You should not say something like, I'm from Russia. Yeah, I'm from Moscow, I'm from Bratsk. This is not what is expected of you, okay? So um, I'm already afraid of asking you to type in your answers because no one talks to me there. But if you could, your nice answers, you could try, yeah? Um, for example, you could say, like, I'm from a faraway village uh, at a stone's throw from here. Yeah, so you use an idiom, you use collocations. Yeah, um, or you can um, go in some other way, I go around it, and you can say something like, where are you from? Yeah, you could say, were I to choose? Yeah, you use an inverted conditional, which is called grammar. Yeah, points for grammar. So were I to choose, um, I would love to live elsewhere in Europe, yeah, for example. So points for grammar. And you basically say one sentence. And they will give you a chance to say maximum two sentences in this part. This is your chance to impress the examiner. So make a list. My tip for you here is make a list of useful phrases on the topics you're going to have in the exam. The topics are in open access in every book. You have a list of topics. General questions like free time, friends, personality, job, future, yeah? Make a list of useful collocations and idioms which uh, you could use at the exam. However, don't uh, learn your answer by heart, yeah? Because the questions are repetitive. The question, where are you from, is very frequently asked at the exam, but don't learn your answer. The examiners are trained to spot those learned answers, yeah? You're like a robot, yeah, delivering this... It doesn't work. Yeah, no points. Nothing good is going to come out of it. Just some phrases, you know, just some useful, nice phrases. Okay. The second task is usually uh, it, it kind of needs some practicing too, and it is quite challenging for most of the exam takers. Not because it is challenging, but because you are pressed for time here. You've got just one minute, okay? One minute to do everything at the same time. It reminds me of part four in listening, yeah, because you have to do it all in one minute. Yeah, time management skills. So you're going to be given three pictures on the same topic, somehow related. Like here, you have people doing things together. Yeah, you can see the pictures. However, you have to choose two of the three pictures and you have to compare them and answer two questions. The questions are, they will be written on your exam card and the examiner will, the interlocutor will read them for you too. So here we go. 
why might the people be doing these things together and how might the people be feeling, all right? Typical mistakes. Number one, uh, the examiner, the exam taker uh, is talking about three pictures. Don't do that. Choose two. Typical mistake number two. The examiner starts off as an eager. I have chosen pictures number one and picture number pictures number one and two because they remind me of my happy childhood. No, okay, ten seconds already again. Don't do that. Just picture one and two. That's all. Typical mistake number three. Uh, in the first picture, I can see the people who are going and are climbing up the mountain in deep snow. They're friends. Blah blah blah. What are you doing? You're describing. Don't describe here, okay? Don't do that. Speculate. Instead of saying they are, they might be, looks as if, and very frequently you won't be able to understand what's happening in the picture. That's why it's a huge aid, those uh, speculation phrases. They might be. And, you know, even the questions they ask of you to be speculating. Why might the people be doing these things together? The people in the first picture might be doing this together because blah, blah, blah. Also not very good because you should compare and contrast pictures. Yeah. So you can start off with picture one and two. Yeah. Voice my choice. So in both pictures, um, people might be doing this together because you're answering the first question and you're speculating and you're comparing. Yes. Yeah? Similarity. So. Uh, in both pictures, uh, people might be uh, doing this activity together because they want to be get closer to each other. Uh, they want to enhance the team spirit, and they might be good friends who have decided uh, to spend more quality time together. Yeah, I've already answered the first question. I used some nice collocations, and I speculated instead of describing. Okay, and how might they be feeling? And here. You can go for the contrast. So in the first picture, the people may be not very happy or they look as if they're cold uh, and this is a challenge for them. While in the second picture, yeah, contrast, um, they might be enjoying their time together because they look as if they're cooking something which could be delicious, bring them some happy memories in the future, something like this, okay? So don't describe. Uh, don't uh, spend very much time talking about one picture and answer two questions. Takes time to get used to this because one minute is never enough. Okay. The third task uh, is a dialogue. Finally, you're talking to candidate B who's in the room with you, you know, and you will be given this kind of a spidergram with a question. The question is why might people have to consider uh, what what my people have to consider when making these decisions. And you have a list of decisions. You have five different things to consider. However, you will have just two minutes to have this dialogue, to have a nice deep conversation on even one of those points. Two minutes, again, not enough. So don't go for all the options. You are not required to discuss all the options. Two or three from the list would be good, okay? One, maybe not enough. Two or three good, five too many, not deep enough. The conversation should be deep and interesting to listen to. And it should not be a monologue because if you start with, uh, okay, the question is, what might people have to consider when making these decisions? So when choosing a university, a person should keep in mind that um, the price of the, uh, of the education also, the people who work there, the, quali the uh, qualifications of the teachers or trainers, blah, blah, blah. And I go on for like 30 seconds. This is a monologue, okay? I need here, they check on the ability uh, to interact with your partner. So why not start with a question, yeah? For example, why don't we start with choosing a university? You're already, you know, using an interactive strategy. You're asking for your partner's opinion. And the partner should go, okay, I think, I believe that... Uh, qualifications of uh, teachers and uh, trainers has a uh, huge importance there. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, or isn't it? And you should keep this ball rolling, okay? Otherwise, it's a monologue and you have failed the task. And the last task is usually um, this one. 
Uh, it is connected to part three. It's the same topic, but here, finally, this will be a monologue. You will have to be, you, you will be asked a question which requires a prolonged answer around one minute um, to get your thoughts on the topic. For example, uh, is it best for people to make decisions on their own or to ask others for advice? It's over here. Yeah. And you go, blah, 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 for one minute. Yeah, I believe that. However, while you're doing that, or while your partner is doing that, candidate B, you should be listening. Because afterwards, you'll be asked, like, what do you think? Do you agree? And you will have to relate to, the, to something you heard there. So this is how it works. And uh, it's going to be around 15 minutes, uh, the this, this speaking part. And you're going to be lucky if it's not on the same day with all the rest of the parts, because you will be exhausted after everything. You have to be ready for that. And my personal tip for you about speaking is um, get to know your partner before entering the room. You'll usually know what time you're going to enter the room at like 12.15. So you come and ask people like, who's got 12.15? And you'll see your partner. So chat before entering the room to get used to their accent and manner of speaking, a bit of stress relief for you. And some more final tips and then a couple of questions maybe from you afterwards. So basically these are the tips. Don't panic, right? Uh, it's gonna be fine anyway. Hard tasks last. Mistakes are okay, practice and read and listen to a lot of things. And we still have a couple of questions, um, a couple of minutes for your questions if you have any. I don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, so let me check the question box. No, nothing here either. Okay, anyway. Uh, the typically asked questions uh, are, can I prepare for this exam on my own? Well, yes, you can. Um, here is a list of books here in the slide, but make sure that for writing, you get a second opinion, you get someone to check your writing, even if it's your partner, and get yourself a speaking pal to practice those speaking parts. And everything is going to be fine in this way. Um, and um, if you want assistance, you can find yourself a uh, teacher or a trainer uh, somewhere to prepare yourself to get this, you know, well-prepared uh, system using the book or a variety of books, which I advise you to do, because one book is never enough. And I thank you very much uh, for joining us today, for listening to us. Unfortunately, I didn't get very much interaction in the chat box, but I hope that this was useful for you and you got the idea introductory of the of this exam if you want more we're going to start a course on monday where in which i'm going to give you more details on each part more exam strategies more tips and definitely we will discuss writing and speaking and all the other parts in more detail so join us um and uh i hope this was useful and uh, if you're going to join i promise you that the course is going to be useful too we will have three Mondays uh, from 6 to 9.15 um, in the evenings starting next week, I think.